Good morning, Presbyterian Church of Broomfield. It is Sunday, May 24th, and like the last several weeks, you are not here. The, the bad news is you're not here. The good news is we're, we're saving on coffee, I guess. I don't know. One, one quick announcement before we start. Our session is going to meet uh, on Zoom this coming Tuesday night, uh, May 26th. Uh, and hopefully we'll have some new information for you about worship and the things going on at the church. Uh, according to the governor and his last uh, clergy call, we're supposed to get some new updates by May 25th. That is tomorrow. Our session meets the next night, so stay tuned. I wish I could do better than that. We, we promise to get information out to you just as soon as we possibly can, and we promise to make the best decisions we can too. I know that we're all eager, eager to get back to uh, normal and at least be able to attend church as we start to move into the summer, but we will let you know uh, ASAP. Okay, I want to start by asking you a question today. How long is 12 years? Now, I know 12 years is exactly 12 years long, but how long is it? it? It truly depends on what's going on, right? 12 years can go by in uh, the blink of an eye, or 12 years can feel like a lifetime, right? It really does depend on what's going on for those 12 years. So if we went back in time 12 years from today, it would be May of 2008, all right? Let's say you welcomed a brand new baby girl in 2008. In 12 years, you would have held her close to you. You would have listened to her say her first words. You would have watched her take her first steps. You'd remember her first day of school, her first missing tooth, learning how to ride a bike, maybe even her first night away from home. And after 12 years, years, your little girl is really on the threshold of becoming a very uh, young woman. And after 12 years, all those things will have flown past. For you, in this scenario, 12 years flies by like it's an afternoon. Now let's go back to 2008, but this time in 2008, you discover that you have a sickness. You find out that you're going to need countless tests, doctor visits, specialist visits, various therapies and diets, and maybe even several operations. For you, the next 12 years are gonna mean the end of a normal family life, the end of work, the end of exercise, the end of shopping and socializing, the end of travel. The next 12 years in front of you are gonna feel like a prison. Pain and suffering over the next 12 years is gonna feel like an eternity. So again, how long is 12 years? It really does depend on what's happening. Now, if you've been following me in my little uh, Tuesday encouragement videos, and some of you prefer that actually much more than the sermon, I get that. Uh, I talked this past week about the story in Mark where Jesus heals the woman who touches his clothes in the hope of being healed. That story is in the Gospels of Mark and Matthew and Luke. And that story is always intertwined with another story of a man named Jairus who comes to Jesus desperately needing his daughter to be healed. And I want to look at those two stories because we're going to see two similar stories of healing, but we're also importantly going to get to compare those stories to our own. Now we know and we will read that the woman who is bleeding has been suffering for, you guessed it, 12 years. 
and she interrupts Jesus as he is heading to see Jairus' daughter. But if you look at the Gospel of Luke, and I learned that this week, for this story, the little girl in the Gospel of Luke is that Jesus is on the way to see is about, you guessed it, 12 years old. How long is 12 years? Let's take a look at both these stories. If you will read with me, I'm going to read Mark 5, 21 through 42. Mark 5, 21 through 42. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue rulers named Jairus came there. Seeing Jesus, he fell at his feet and pleaded earnestly with him, My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went on with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all that she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him and he turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, the disciples answered, and yet you can ask, who touched my clothes? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, and trembling with fear, she told him the whole truth. He said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. While Jesus was still speaking, some men came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue ruler. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Ignoring what they said, Jesus told the synagogue ruler, Don't be afraid, just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue ruler, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, Why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. And after he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl stood up and walked around. She was 12 years old. At this time, they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. That is the reading of our scripture today. The fifth chapter of Mark is really one amazing miracle after another. Uh, it begins with Jesus curing a demon-possessed man. That's the story of how Jesus heals a man from many demons and then cast them all into a herd of pigs. And after this, Jesus then is in our passage, and he's on the way to heal a young girl on the verge of death. When he is interrupted by a woman who is also in desperate need of help. And I need to say here that just this little bit of our passage alone seems to help me remember about the times when God sort of interrupts me or interrupts you. None of us like to be interrupted. And sometimes there's a very 
serious and divinely inspired lesson that God may be teaching us when we get interrupted from our busy and familiar schedules. I still remember a few years ago trying to write a sermon on compassion and grace, and I kept getting interrupted by phone calls. Stop bugging me. <laughs> I'm trying to write about grace. <laughs> yeah, I learned a lot. And, and clearly this virus has been a major interruption to all of us. This is the same thing. I think the focus of the story is that Jesus is on his way to heal this little girl, but suddenly he's interrupted by a woman who's in great pain and suffering, and by attending to her, the little girl dies. It appears to be a tragic and, and a fatal interruption. Jairus, now, Jairus was the official of the synagogue, and because of that, he had influence and he had prestige. But when he comes to Jesus, he's coming like any desperate father might come. He comes, and in verse 2, we read that he walks up and falls at Jesus' feet, and he pleads earnestly, my little girl is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she'll be healed and live. Now, we have no idea what's happened to the little girl. Maybe she fell from a roof. Maybe she's badly hurt. Maybe she was sick. Maybe she had a lingering disease. We don't know why this little girl is dying. But all we can see is a fairly influential and dignified religious leader falling at the feet of Jesus, begging him to come and save his little girl. So Jesus goes, and so does a large crowd. This is uh, uh, probably an interruption of sorts too, right? Maybe the group just wanted to see what Jesus would do. Maybe they wanted to talk with him along the way, or maybe get their own healing. We don't know. I think if I were Jairus, I'd be trying to get the crowd away from Jesus. You know, come on, people, don't slow him down. He's He's on his way to help my daughter, and he doesn't have time for other things right now. But clearly, they refuse to be left behind, and they go with Jesus along the way. But then our story takes a turn. One woman is singled out. We don't know her name. We don't know anything about her, except that she has suffered from some kind of hemorrhage for 12 years. Her suffering is clearly much more than physical. She suffered from the various cures that doctors have tried. She's lost all of her money doing it, and she's continually getting worse in her situation. And to add insult to injury, literally, this woman is also subjected to social condemnations, whereby she would have been pronounced unclean. This would mean she'd be unable to take part in any religious rituals. She could have no public contact, she could not go into the temple, and she would even be required to live without her husband if she had one. This woman also comes through the crowd and apparently uh, at, the, uh, getting, at the risk of getting stomped on or trampled by the crowd, she makes a huge effort to get close to Jesus in the middle of this large crowd. And she believes that if she can just touch his robe, he will, she will be healed. The woman doesn't even want to speak to Jesus. She's just a person who wants to touch him and, and actually not even him. It's his clothes. It's almost like she's saying, if I could just brush up against Jesus, I think something good would happen. It's an amazing act of desperation, and it's an amazing act of faith. And when she does, instantly, her bleeding stops, and she's healed. Everything is great, except Jesus stops, probably much to the dismay of Jairus, right? And asked, who touched my clothes? 
Now, the disciples think this is ridiculous because there is such a large mob crowding around him. And I have to believe that Jesus was not ignorant of what had happened, nor had he that he decided that, or that he needed to be told who had touched him. But why ask the question? Why stop at such a critical time and do this? Dan Meyer is the pastor at Christ Church of Oak Brook in Illinois, and he offers some possible ideas here as to why Jesus stopped and addressed the situation. Uh, one reason why me that Jesus delayed in order to give the woman the opportunity to give her own testimony to her healing. If Jesus had not stopped and asked who touched his garment, no one would have known about the miracle except the woman. But in verse 33, the woman comes to him, falls at his feet, trembling, and tells him the whole truth. She pours out her story and allows others to hear what just happened. Number two, Jesus. when Jesus stops, he makes it clear that this woman needs to understand, and that everyone else does too, that it is her faith that has healed her, not his garment. Uh, I think this is important for us today. Sometimes we think if we say the right prayers or read the right verses, or in this case, let our fingers touch his clothes, then we will be healed. Like Jesus is sort of a lucky charm that we need to have in order to get what we want. And by saying this, Jesus lets everyone know that it's not about the clothes. Jesus wants uh, her and everyone to believe that it is her faith that has done the work here. It's her relationship with Jesus by faith that made her whole. And it is our relationship with Jesus by faith that makes us whole. Another reason Meyer notes is that he, pub he thinks that it's a a gracious act of our Lord to make it publicly known that this woman has been made clean so that she no longer has to be considered unclean. Right there in front of everyone, the woman is healed and made clean, and this might be one of the reasons why Jesus stopped and took the time to have the conversation. But I think most importantly and significantly is that the delay of Jesus results in a greater miracle and a greater faith on the part of Jairus and the crowd, for by the time this is all over, his young daughter is not sick anymore because she's died. And he gets the horrible news, don't bother Jesus anymore, your daughter has died. And Jesus responds, ignores what they're saying, and responds and says, don't be afraid, only believe. Don't be afraid, only believe. I think uh, this week I thought that was pretty interesting. He doesn't say to Jairus, don't worry, your daughter's going to be just fine. Or Jairus, don't be sad, I'm going to raise her from the dead. But instead, he says, don't be afraid, only believe. Eugene Peterson in the message says it can be translated, don't listen to them, just trust me. And isn't that what Jesus says to all of us all of the time in every single situation? They get to the house and Jesus announces that the little girl isn't dead, that she's merely sleeping, and the people laugh at him. But the joke's on them, really, as Jesus goes into the house, takes the hand of this 12-year-old, and says, little girl, get up, and she does. Now, after reading this story, I know we can relate to both of these people. Jairus and the woman are both desperate people, right? And we have all been desperate before. We can relate to Jairus. We know what it's like to be so worried for someone we love. We know what it's like to lose someone to death. We know what it's like 
to beg our Lord for healing and for life. And we can also relate to the woman. Many of us have lived with sickness or disease or a situation for a long period of time. People who are sick lose so much, especially as they experience it over a long period of time. When you're sick, you lose control over your body. You might need to start taking meds or uh, eat certain things or avoid certain things. You lose control over what goes into your mouth when you're sick for a long period of time. You kind of lose your identity. I mean, people start to identify you with your or by your illness. Oh, yeah, he's that guy with the skin problem. Or, or yeah, she's that woman that has cancer, right? And both of these people lose other things too. When, when things happen, you lose certainty about what's coming next. You lose your place in society. You lose resources. You lose hope. And these are, there are people in our church and people that we know who suffer and are suffering right now from these things. But I want us to note two things as we wrap up this morning and see if we can apply this to our own lives and our own situations. I titled this, path, this message, Asking the Better Question. Now, if you look back on the passage, the only person that asks any question at all is Jesus, mainly who touched my clothes, right? But for, note first that neither Jairus nor the woman ask any question to Jesus. Jairus comes and states, my little girl is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she'll be healed and live. The woman who touches his clothes speaks nothing at all. Neither of them ask what I would consider pretty reasonable questions depending on the situation. And maybe some of you have asked these questions. Why is this happening to my little girl? Why is this happening to me? Why is God even allowing these things to take place in my life? I know I've asked those things about the coronavirus. Lord, why are you allowing this? What's going on here? And those questions can easily morph into some pretty negative places, right? Where is God in all of this? Does God even exist? If there is a God, why does God hate me so much? You can see the spiral going downward, right? But neither Jairus nor the woman ask those or any questions. They come to Jesus, fall at his feet, seeking help and healing. Now, we have all watched people we love get sick, and we have all watched people we love die. We can all relate to that, and in the midst of grief, I know we say things and do things that might not make any sense. But for us today, the conviction and the prayer that I seem to be learning, and this is the, the application part for me this week, is that we need to ask some better questions when these things hit. How about some of these questions? Lord, what do you want, what do you want to say to me right now? Uh, Lord, what do you want me to say to this family or to this person? Will you please take over, God, and help me to do and say what you want? Will you show me what to do? Will you give me the words right now? Because I'm at a loss, and I'm hurting, and I'm frustrated. Lord Jesus, what do you want me to do? In faith, we ask Jesus to show us what to do. Or maybe this, what's next here, Lord? What can you do with this circumstance? Can you show me how I can be used by you and for you in this situation. I don't like it, but I know you love me and want me to follow you even in the midst of all this. I have to believe that those kinds of questions give us 
access to God's power and God's wisdom, and they demonstrate our faith that God can do and will do his good and perfect will. In all of our situations, Jesus Christ is able to address everything that we're going through. He's able to handle them. Our Lord is never desperate or anxious, and he is continually aware of all that's going on in our lives. Just a side note here, when Jesus says to the woman who's been bleeding for 12 years, your faith has healed you, uh, she was relieved of that suffering and of this illness that was causing her to bleed. But the Greek word for healed here actually means saved. Your faith has saved you. Even in healing the physical problem of the woman, Jesus does even more for her than what she's seeking. His love for us is gigantic, and Jesus always does more than we could ever imagine. Friends, I know this virus and this quarantine have been difficult, but my message to you today is this. Our God is never limited by anything. He's not limited by anything. There's no problem that's too big or too long lasting or too complicated or too painful or too many years ago or too whatever for Jesus to handle. Let me close with this. There was a story uh, I heard of a young man who once went to a fortune teller and the man was told by the fortune teller, I see that you will be miserable until you reach the age of 47. And the man asked, well, when I become 47, will something wonderful happen to me that will relieve my pain? And the fortune teller said, no, you'll still be miserable. It's just that by then you'll be used to it. I'm not really sure anyone gets used to suffering and we don't like it. And we will continue to experience it. But in the meantime, Jesus says to Jairus and he says to us, don't be afraid, just believe. And keep learning how to ask the better question. Lord, what is next? How can this be used to help somebody else? What do you need me to say or do right here in the midst of this? Jairus and the woman come to Jesus as, as if they believe that their suffering was not a completed event, but an open one still full of possibilities for redemption or resurrection. And we need to do the same thing. Let us pray. Lord, we ask you to help us ask the better questions. I know it's easy to ask, why is this happening to me? Why is this happening to this person? Why is this happening to our world? Um, why, do you, why do you not like, like that person? Things like that. And Lord, we know that none of those questions are good questions uh, and, and that we need to come to you in complete faith uh, understanding that you are God and fully in charge, but also understanding that you love us and that you do bring healing and redemption and new life, even if it's not the way we want to define that. So, Father, we come to you and ask you for forgiveness for our uh, attitudes of thinking that this is all about us, all about our own situation but also, Lord, to ask you to help us trust you, that you can handle all of these problems, that you can uh, address these things, that you have not given up or uh, find yourself at a loss for what's going on. Lord, I pray for our church. I pray that we would turn to you even more during this time, that we would dive into your word, that we would come to know you better. I pray that we would uh, be patient in our suffering and in the suffering that we see happening to people we love. But Lord, we ask you for healing. We ask you to cleanse us. We ask you to save us because we need that. 
And Lord, in the meantime, let us be people who seek out how we can help others, how we can help each other, how we can encourage our COVID buddy, how we can encourage people we see uh, who interact with us during the day, how we might bring encouragement and healing and wholeness to people we run into at the store or wherever we are. Lord, give us the strength to walk through this. Thank you that you love us. Thank you that you promise to be with us and never forsake us. And thank you most of all uh, for your son, Jesus Christ, who died for us out of this great love that we might know you. Lord, draw us nearer to you. Thank you for all that you've given us. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I hope you have a good week. Uh, we will let you know what's going on with worship service. And uh, until we talk again, uh, I'm praying for you. I hope that this is a great day and a good week ahead. Talk to you soon.